And it is a great pleasure, actually, to give a table to our member correspondent of Academy of Science, uh, Professor Simeonov, who is actually just excellent scientist whom I know for a very long time since his thesis. And he was training actually in, in English. They have very interesting discoveries there. Then he worked in Japan and he organized a very good, very interesting institute of neuroscience in Nizhny Novgorod. And now he is actually just moving to Moscow. So. And they're doing now, he will talk about the glial, glial cells and uh, some in interesting, very interesting investigations. So please, <coughs> you have 50 minutes. <laughs> okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I was asked to give this talk in English. And uh, this is uh, easy for me, but uh, according to the audience, it may be scared of some people who were here yesterday. Uh, I, I have a microphone, I think it's, uh, it's not, 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 not. Can, can you hear? This it one? Will, this oh, that one. This is my video. Okay. Well, so at least it uh, gives me something to handle and uh, keep my hand busy. And uh, yes, okay. Uh, this, the whole uh, conference is dedicated to optogenetics and optopharmacology. And these are two uh, main direction in optical methods in, in, uh, in neuroscience in general. And the third method uh, would be op op optical sensing, as uh, Piotr Brzezkowski yesterday mentioned to us. So, and uh, in the view of this situation, I uh, changed a little bit my title. Originally, it was optogenetic approaches to study neuron glial interactions in the brain. And then I looked carefully at what we're doing in the lab, and I figured out that uh, we're doing all different uh, approaches uh, which might be of interest of people here and so I decided to a little bit broaden the, the subject and talk about all different optical approaches I mentioned optogenetics, optical sensing and uh, optopharmacology to some extent uh, and y y you will see wh what we're doing. And since I'm talking about neuron glial interactions, I would like to also start with some historical introduction. Because many people whom I'm talking, especially young physiologists, they don't uh, always appreciate the importance of glial cells in, uh, in uh, uh, brain function, brain operation. And this partially related to the fact that uh, many modern uh, physiology uh, textbooks are a little bit outdated and uh, uh, discuss glial cells as like uh, very primitive supporting cells and indeed uh, uh, there is a good historic reason for that and I will start from old times uh, people who attended my lectures they probably seen already this image and this is image prepared by René Descartes in the uh, 16th century uh, probably it's, uh, already in uh, 17th century and uh, before René Descartes in ancient world uh, uh, people uh, didn't really think that brain play any uh, important uh, function in our body. Uh, they thought uh, all our emotions and thoughts are originating from the heart. And because of that, we have in different languages such expression like in English it says, uh, I wish you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, in Russian it says, Я желаю вам всего сердца. And this comes to origi origins of language when people thought that the heart is responsible for emotions and for thinking. And in, in Middle Ages, when René Descartes started to you know, investigate and uh, think of the human body, uh, he uh, started to think that the brain may be, so, uh, may be somehow important for controlling the body. And he drew the schematic, and the brain was pictured as a uh, connection of pipelines which uh, had gates inside and the fluid was circulating within these pipelines and uh, coming towards the muscles and making muscle to contract. So basically the, uh, the brain was given a function to control body. So this was a big step towards, but this is uh, 17th century and now we're coming to uh, uh, 20th century and the new theory emerged about which we know as uh, connectome or synaptic organization of the brain. So the idea here coming from the, again, modern methods uh, to, to available to scientists uh, based on the electrical properties of the neurons. Uh, as you know, neurons is one of the important types of the cells in the brain. 
and neurons connected to each other by synaptic connections and there was the idea that uh, all the thoughts and all brain function and operation based on the electrical signal propagation within neuronal network and this propagation determined by the connections between neurons. Uh, this connection could be excitatory, inhibitory and the weight of these connections determined by synaptic plasticity and therefore synaptic plasticity may be a cellular mechanism for learning and memory and again this uh, picture moving from one presentation to another, from one textbook to another and of course it's completely wrong. The wrong in terms, well, maybe I, I, it's not right to say it's completely wrong. It's wrong to a large extent because the, brain, uh, the, the neurons are not located in an empty brain. Here you can see neurons and empty space between them, like in the space. It's not like that. It's all space filled by other cell types and these other cell types also organizing the networks. But anyway, electrical activity of neurons and relatively easy approach to measure electrical activity with electrode-based techniques allows us or allowed some people to think of the brain as an electrical organ, some kind of computer. And you might even hear uh, some presentation these days that you just need to record electrical activity from the brain, like with EEG, and you can make brain-computer interface. And then you can control robots and devices and so forth. But, uh, you know, uh, modern science uh, cellular physiology is actually moving on and this, uh, even this view is uh, g getting a little bit outdated and maybe one day we will see it as primitive as the view of René Descartes with all these pipelines in the brain and so forth. Uh, what I would like to uh, uh, sort of uh, bring to your attention that's not only one networks, network of neurons exist in the brain. There are other cell types, namely astrocyte, Astrocytes. Astrocytes form quite complex uh, network in the brain. Unlike neurons, they have uh, territories which are not overlapping, but these cells are also connected to each other, not by chemical synapses, but they're connected by gap junctions and form rel uh, relatively complex and region-specific uh, networks. Sometimes people even refer them as a meshwork uh, because of the, their ability to form some, uh, some sort of a mesh. Uh, without uh, in, uh, sort of over, without forming overlapping domains, uh, astrocyte uh, also also astrocyte uh, electrically passive cells, and in the era of uh, electrode-based techniques, they considered to be passive cells. Supportive cells are not necessary for information processing. Uh, modern techniques like optical methods, what we are talking about at this meeting, uh, reveal that in astrocyte. Uh, quite complex uh, forms of activity can be generated. Uh, and one of these forms of signaling is calcium signaling, which appears in the different uh, astrocytic uh, domains within single cells. Uh, these calcium signals and calcium elevation can propagate over larger territories of within the cell or even uh, propagate within astrocytic meshwork or astrocytic sensitium because uh, gap junctions uh, between uh, astrocytes form uh, this structure which uh, resembles very much sensitium, uh, as you know, which uh, permeable for small molecules and ions. And uh, 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 therefore, uh, astrocytes uh, operating in the brain, th their activity, uh, calcium dynamics, is somehow reflecting uh, information which uh, comes to the brain and this calcium activity uh, important and it's regulated by activity of neuronal network and can activity in astrocytic network can influence activity in neuronal network. So brain at least consists of two cellular networks, one neuronal and one other astrocytic uh, interacting uh, with each other and affecting uh, signaling within each other. Uh, all this astrocytic field is uh, very, very rapidly developing and it started maybe like three or four decades ago, and even within this period of time, relatively short, uh, there, there was several myths uh, related to astrocytic physiology, and one uh, quite widely spread myth that a uh, number of astrocytes in the brain uh, ten times higher than number of neurons. Uh, this uh, appeared to be not true, and when careful, carefully uh, people considered the numbers of astrocytes and neurons, in different brain regions, this is in human brain, this slide shows in human brain, it's uh, turned to be uh, that numbers of astrocytes is not so high, and in human brain matter, uh, 
in, in the cortex, the, the ratio between neurons and astrocyte 165 to 1. In white matter, well, well this method was based on the <coughs> counting of, oh, sorry, on the counting of uh, uh, nuclei of the cells. And in gray <coughs> matter, we have all the nuclei and somas of the neurons, while in white matter, we don't have nuclei and somas of neurons. So therefore, number of neurons is there zero. So we know, of course, we have uh, ax axons in, in white matter. But we also have lots of astrocytes there. So the number of astrocytes to neurons in infinity to zero. But in other uh, brain regions, uh, the, these ratios are more interesting. For example, in thalamus, uh, to, uh, 17 astrocytes correspond to one neuron, and brainstem, 10 astrocytes to one neuron. And in cerebellum, it's uh, vice versa, 10, 10 neurons to one astrocyte. And <clears throat> when you look at these numbers already, you, you, you start to think that uh, depending on the function of brain structure, you need specific ratio between neurons and astrocytes. It's something interesting is going on, and actually nobody knows in details why these ratios exist and what's the reason for that. So, again, this field of uh, neurophysiology is absolutely unexplored. Another myth is uh, uh, related to the numbers of astrocytes and organization of the brain. There was a myth suggesting that more organized the brain high the number of astrocytes relatively to neurons. And again, it turned to be not very accurate suggestion. And here you, at, the, uh, at this slide, you can see this, this is the ratio of uh, astrocytes to neurons in different animals. And you can see here, for example, Drosophila, rabbit, cat, human, elephant, whale, and so forth. Uh, uh, aligned, uh, so they basically range depending on this ratio, and you can see that the uh, ratio of uh, astrocyte to neurons is not highest in human. It's actually highest in elephant and whales, the larger animals. So somehow the ratio of astrocyte to neurons are related to the, to the size of animals, not to the complexity of the brain operation. And if, even if you look at the uh, different primates, like you can see here, these are different primates, these are gorillas, these are macacos, human, and other kinds of monkey. And you can see that there is no dramatic difference in the, in the ratio of uh, astrocytes and neurons. Also, in, the human, uh, in humans, you can see slightly higher ratio of astrocytes to neurons, but it's not dramatically different from, from example, from uh, gorilla or chimpanzee. But uh, there is one still evolutionary difference in astrocyte, and this related to the complexity of the cells. <coughs> Here below you can see astrocytes of mouse, uh, rhesus monkey, and the human. And what you can see here that astrocytes get more more complex uh, with development of the brain. If you look at the complexity of neurons, complexity of neurons doesn't change that dramatically. Neurons in mice and rats and human neurons are organized more, more or less in, in a uh, similar way in terms of their uh, morphology. But if you look at the astrocytes, astrocytes get a lot more complex. So human astrocytes have more branches, these branches say branchier, uh, they're more uh, complex and larger in size. In addition, uh, human astrocytes uh, also can be subdivided on several classes. Well, actually, it's not only human. This is all primates. That's char characteristic to all primates. Uh, in mice and uh, rats, we have only two types of astrocytes. These are fibrous and protoplasmic astrocytes. In human uh, and primates, uh, we have five types of astrocytes, and you can see them uh, listed here. So this is Intralaminar astrocyte, this is a uh, varicose projection astrocyte, uh, protoplasmic astrocyte, like similar to uh, rats and mice, uh, polarized astrocyte, and fibrous astrocyte. And more interestingly, if you look at here, at, at this schematic, this is the uh, cortical layers, and maybe a microcolumn. If you look here on the neurons, this is the schematic of different neuronal types which form microcolumn in the brain. And astrocytes are also uh, divided and separated by types according to the, uh, their uh, uh, distribution within uh, human uh, cortical layers. 
or, or primate cortical layer. And this another subject in modern neurophysiology is completely unexplored. No one knows why uh, different types of astrocytes exist and what their functional relevance and what's their role. If that would be only supportive cells, helping ne neurons or synapses to live and feed them, you don't need for five types of astrocytes. That must be something more important, more interesting uh, happening in the brain. And without understanding this, we will never come to the point how the brain operates. We will never uh, read, like, sort of mind or read uh, some information processing by measuring electrical activity happening in the cortex. So we need to use some more sophisticated techniques. And I sometimes also give this example. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting paper. Unfortunately, this is uh, only one paper for the moment, so it always uh, raises questions. But uh, the result is it's quite interesting and coming from a respectful lab of Mike and Nedergaard. And they performed a very elegant study. So when they used human pro progenitor glial cells and they injected them in mice, so this was, of course, immunosuppressed mice, and they injected human progenitor cells, and they start to develop in human astrocytes in the mice brain. And then they compared uh, performance and, plasti and synaptic plasticity uh, in these animals, and they found that the mice become smarter, uh, synaptic plasticity improved, and this was attributed to existence of human astrocytes. So basically, conclusion from the study was that when astrocytes in human evolved, that's what we really see from morphology, human became smarter than, say, mice or rats and, and, or animals. So it's not in neurons, it's, it's an astrocyte, all this uh, sort of evolutionary advantages of human brain. So, but anyway, this is, a, again, a very questionable uh, conclusion, and one can uh, argue against this, but it requires some further studies, and of course, it uh, gives some thoughts and suggestion for the uh, uh, future research. Well, and so coming back, uh, coming to more sort of practical questions, I would like to emphasize that astrocytes interacting uh, with neurons and interacting on different levels, interacting on the level of extrasynaptic signaling, astrocytes release different substances which act on neurons directly on neuronal extrasynaptic membrane, but most people know about interaction between neurons and astrocytes on the level of synapses. And we already heard to, uh, during this meeting, I, I think from uh, Nikolai Nikolaevich first time, about uh, tripartite synapse. The synapse which consists of three parts, presynaptic, postsynaptic, uh, and astrocytic presynaptic process. So this is a ter term is already coined for several uh, years and maybe several decades already. And uh, in a very simplistic way, astrocyte uh, has homeostatic function in, in this situation. During synaptic transmission, neurotransmitter is released to synaptic cleft. Some of this neurotransmitter escapes. For example, here uh, we, we have example of glutamate. And this glutamate is taken by astrocytic transporters. So astrocyte, presynaptic astrocytic process is very very rich in transporters, and glutamate is quickly removed. So the synapses uh, become uh, clean and ready for the uh, second synaptic event. Uh, also, uh, accumulation of potassium related to synaptic transmission is also removed by uh, astrocyte. If this process is somehow altered, they uh, can malfunction. If they malfunction, we have lots of problems. This will be accumulation of glutamate in extracellular space, of potassium in extracellular space. Ac uh, glutamate, as you know, uh, you know, create cytotoxicity, excitotoxicity. Potassium also can cause epileptic seizures, etc. So only malfunction of this uh, phenomenon, of this uh, sort of uh, interaction between neurons and astrocytes already can link to many phenomena which are attributed uh, purely to neurons, like epilepsy or neurodegeneration, etc. Uh, but in fact, these uh, parameters might not really malfunction. They might be regulated. And now let's imagine that if astrocytic process retracted a little bit, so moved away slightly from the synapse, and then you will have less efficient glutamate and potassium uptake. And in this situation, glutamate dwell time in the synapse will be longer, and synapse will be more efficient. 
you can generate in principle uh, phenomena similar to LTP or synaptic plasticity without changing presynaptic part or postsynaptic. You just retract the strategic process a little bit. And indeed, modern, f uh, modern uh, studies showing that astrocytic processes are very plastic and they can, be they can retract, they can move towards synapses. And synapses will operate differently without changes in the receptors like LTP, postsynaptic receptors or presynaptic release probability, etc. So astrocytes are important for synaptic transmission too, for efficiency of synaptic transmission. And not only for efficiency of synaptic transmission per se, but also for classical uh, 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 plasticity for classical LTP. For example, uh, this uh, schematic shows importance of astrocyte for classical and MDA-dependent LTP. Also, uh, maybe not all plasticity and MDA-dependent, as we heard already, uh, but uh, still many classical forms of uh, synaptic plasticity, uh, long-term potentiation, long-term depression, depends on activation of an MDA receptors. And the NMDA receptors, as all you know, require several events to happen to be activated. First, of course, they require agonist, which is glutamate for them. Glutamate is released by presynaptic uh, neuron, presynaptic part. And second, they require depolarization of membrane, of postsynaptic membrane, uh, which is required to remove their voltage-dependent magnesium block. So when these two events coincide, they're supposed to be activated. No. It's not that simple, and the MDA receptors also require for the activation of coagonist. And this coagonist could be either deserine or glycine. So when deserine and glycine binds to the MDA receptors, that's the third event which is required for the activation, and therefore for synaptic plasticity. So in this case, we have synaptic and extrasynaptic and MDA receptors. Uh, you can see this on the schematic. And uh, these receptors, they have different affinity the synaptic receptors have more affinity for deserine, uh, extrasynaptic receptors have more affinity for glycine, and both of these uh, substances, both of these amino acids released by astrocytes. So astrocytes release these uh, amino acids in calcium-dependent manner. When calcium increases in astrocyte, then astrocyte releases deserine or, or glycine. If astrocyte doesn't release this, of course, uh, concentration of deserine or glycine might be relatively low, also, some researchers suggest that even neurons can release deserine and glycine, but uh, this is the sort of discussion between different groups, some suggesting that astrocytes are the major source of this. But anyway, uh, what, what I would like to emphasize, that astrocyte can, to some extent, through release of uh, glia transmitters, regulate synaptic plasticity. And if they uh, release glia transmitter and if they have calcium elevation, so then in this area, uh, plasticity may be uh, enhanced or accelerated. Uh, uh, and if they're not active, so then even neuronal plasticity in this area uh, might be suppressed. All in all, pattern of astrocytic calcium activity can regulate what happens in the neuronal network on the, on the level of synapses, just by regulating basic synaptic plasticity, and on the ability of neurons in the neuronal synaptic network generate synaptic plasticity. Okay, on this I would like to conclude my introduction and go so, uh, so directly to uh, calcium imaging because I, uh, what I wanted to say in my introduction that calcium dynamics in astrocytes it's a very important phenomenon which we need to study to understand how our brain operates and it only became possible uh, with more development of modern imaging uh, or optical imaging techniques and optical stimulation techniques. Uh, before that, before this era, we had mostly electrode-based techniques and we studied a lot what happens in neurons. And this is absolutely in in insufficient knowledge to understand how the brain operates in, in total. Okay, and I, I go now to a very methodical part uh, to study calcium dynamics. Uh, we need to introduce calcium sensors in the cells and I call it dialoading approaches here and it probably should be called uh, uh, introduction of the calcium sensing molecules, but this would be a more general title. And again, I would like to uh, show this slide showing a variety of different uh, loading techniques. And we, uh, in fact, in our lab, we used uh, most of these techniques. Uh, the most simple and most ancient technique uh, 
uh, would be to load cells through the PyPy pad. So, or loading cells through the PyPy pad. So, what you do in this case, you use either sharp electrode or patch electrode, uh, and then load the, uh, this electrode uh, with the uh, fluorescent dye, calcium uh, uh, sensitive fluorescent dye, and then you can, if it's sharp electrode, you penetrate the cell and then load the cell through the sharp electrode. This is uh, the most time consuming technique because sharp electrodes is very sharp and this takes time uh, f to fill the cell. Another approach is the load the pipette, uh, patch, uh, pipette with fluorescent dye, then you do whole cell recording and you make the relatively big hole in the cell membrane, load the cell with fluorescent dye. And there another technique is electroporation. Again, you use patch pipette, you come close to the cell, give electrical pulses, which uh, make uh, holes in the membrane, and through these holes you load the cell with uh, your fluorescent dye. The third technique uh, is a little, uh, might sound a little bit more complicated than whole cell recording and whole cell patch loading technique, but it has advantages. So you load the cell with fluorescent dye without changing uh, or without dialyzing the cell, so you don't really uh, replace all the content of the cytoplasm, which is sometimes important for some types of experiments. And I would say we use these uh, techniques and mainly technique number two, whole cell patch uh, loading technique for at least maybe the last 20 years. And this was uh, quite routine technique and it was, it was useful and gave a lot of information about what's going on in the brain and different cell types. But now technology is developing and, and, and we start to work with uh, brain slices with uh, cultured cells, but now we need to look more and more in vivo what happens to the brain uh, in intact brain. And there are several loading techniques were adopted for the uh, recordings in the, in the whole brain. For example, you can see here loading cells with fluorescent dye here again. So this is uh, loading uh, tissue with uh, acetoxin methyl ester of the dye. So uh, in this part, in the first cases, we use polar fluorescent dye, so it's not membrane permeable, it's water soluble. In this case, we use esters of this dye, uh, and these dyes, when they in ester form, they are not fluorescent and they are uh, uh, lipid soluble, so they 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 can go through the uh, cell membrane easily, and when they get into the cell, they are processed by uh, uh, esterase. So esterase remove this ester, and they uh, become polar fluorescent dyes within the cell. And this technique is quite useful. So you just load the dye into the brain tissue. It gets into the cells, and the cells become fluorescent and, and bright, and you they can report calcium in these cells. This is dextrin conjugated loading. This is some variation of this technique. And another technique is uh, electroporation, bulk electroporation, when you electroporate the uh, polar dye not in one cell, but in a group of cells. Uh, but uh, when we come to optogenetical methods, uh, we probably would be dealing with the last row of techniques. So this uh, technique here shown is a viral transduction. So when we use the virus, it could be one of many types of viruses, which we already heard. Uh, yesterday it could be adeno associated virus, it could be adenovirus, it could be lentivirus, it's uh, uh, the same family of viruses as HIV, it could be rabivirus, etc. So the, there are ma many approaches have been uh, tried in, in, in the labs, and uh, in our lab we mainly use adeno associated virus, which, which is quite convenient, also it has uh, very small cargo, so we cannot really introduce very large uh, uh, amounts of genetic material to deliver to the cells, but <coughs> still it can be useful if you just want to introduce uh, one fluorescent protein or one chenolarodopsin to particular uh, cell types. And of course this is uh, one of the main advantages of these techniques. So you, you can deal with not with all cells in the area which are electroporated or take the dye uh, or, or, uh, or specific uh, sort of uh, fluorescent molecules, but you uh, can uh, uh, trigger expression of this uh, fluorescent uh, construct or uh, chenolarodopsin or optogenetic construct in a specific population of cells, because all different cells, they have expression of different proteins in them, 
And if you know about cell-specific expression of particular proteins, you can uh, make expression of your construct of interest on the promoter of this, of this gene, and then you can uh, get only population of the cells uh, expressing uh, what you need. Uh, another technique is in utero electroporation. Uh, this technique is quite useful if you don't have virus. You can just uh, take uh, sort of plasmid. You can electroporate into the brain of uh, animal uh, in uterus. And then uh, these cells in the, in the brain will, uh, cells which are born in this particular stage of uh, development, so then uh, they will express the, the protein of your interest. And this uh, technique is uh, especially useful for people who study brain development. Also, sometimes physiologists uh, use it for uh, its simplicity, and if you don't want to uh, spend time to develop a uh, particular virus and generate virus in, in, uh, in a high titer, you, you, you can quickly test what's happening uh, by electroporating in utero uh, your genetic construct. And of course, the ultimate uh, goal and ultimate experiment would be uh, to work with transgenic animals when the animals are born already with particular sensor or particular kind of construct, for example, of, of the genetic construction or adoption in the particular uh, uh, population of cells. Okay, and now I give you several examples. This is an example of, uh, let's call it ancient technique, when the cells were loaded uh, through patch pipette with fluorescent dye. This is polar dye. Uh, we typically loaded cells with uh, two dyes. One was morphological tracer, like Alexa 594. So then we can see a beautiful morphology of the cell with all the dendrites and spines, etc. And another was calcium sensor. I, I will show it. Uh, more on this later, but I just want to show you this how this look like in in real experiment. So this is two photon image uh, in hippocampal slice, and you can see pyramidal neuron. It's patched, with, and this is patched pipette. It's very bright. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I, I know. So, um, so I, I just want to point. Uh, yeah, okay. So this is the this is patched pipette. This is source of fluorescent dye. Uh, then it loads this cell, and then we did Z stack, and then 3D reconstruction of this. Uh, this is pyramidal neuron in C1 region of hippocampus. So then you can appreciate this three dimensional structure. Or if you want to move along this uh, dendrite, you can see uh, the whole uh, neuron. You see the soma is pretty small compared to the size of the dendrite. And uh, dendrite is also very branchy, and you can find spines here, and then you can study particular synapses in the proximal distal dendrites and look at the calcium dynamics in them, if, if you're interested. Uh, <coughs> another example is uh, astrocyte. Astrocyte looks pretty much different from neuron. So this is soma of the astrocyte, and these are all small astrocytic proteins. They're very ramified, lots of branches, uh, we have, we can see here primary branches, small branchlets, and this is the territory, the main of the astrocyte. And here again, you you see astrocyte stained with two dyes. So we use typically, as I said, morphological uh, tracer and calcium dye, which are excited by the same wavelength. In in our case, we use 810 uh, nanometers wavelength to excite the fluorescence in both dyes, but we used, uh, because dyes emit in different parts of the spectra, so we use different filters, different photomultipliers uh, to make these pictures so we can see morphology and at the same time we can see calcium dynamics uh, in these cells. So another technique which I also mentioned, this is uh, membrane permeable dyes. Here we use, used uh, Aragon Green 488 BAPTA AM. Dye AM, it stands for acetoxymethyl ester, and this is the uh, group which allows uh, dye to penetrate the membrane, and then it's cut off by the esterase, and this, uh, you can see many cells are stained. This is part of the hippocampal slice again, and the second uh, image here, you can see uh, image of cell stained with sulfur, I mean 101, uh, this uh, fluorescent dye is astrocyte-specific marker. It's taken by astrocytes, and then you can compare which cells are actually astrocytes and which are 
also uh, sort of uh, contain uh, calcium sensor, and then you can perform experiments and study calcium dynamics in astrocytes. Okay, electroporation. Uh, we've done electroporation uh, in several occasions in our lab, and we started to collaborate on this method with Tamomi Shimagori uh, from Rikian Brain Science Institute, where I used to work uh, for quite a long time. And Tamomi is uh, one of the leading experts in, the, in this technique, and sh you know, uh, when people do electroporation, sometimes they just bring genetic material in the uterus, so they, uh, so basically the technique is shown here. So uh, what you do, you shave the skin of the animal, then you cut and uh, uh, take out uterus, and then you uh, look, uh, take genetic material which you want to electroporate, then you find out embryo, and then you can identify even different parts of the brain, and then you electroporate with uh, uh, electroporator this genetic material which you in, in injected in, into this uh, embryonic uh, brain parts. So most of the people who work with electroporation, they electroporate to the entire brain. And Tamomi could basically electroporate to the particular brain regions. And then but she was doing electro, uh, neurodevelopment studies. Sh she can actually trace the fate of particular cells born on, on this day of uh, embryo uh, uh, of development of embryo uh, and see w where they actually end up and what their function, etc. So uh, what we've done with this technique, for example, uh, before we established our collaboration with Piotr Brzezowski. Uh, we collaborated with his rival, uh, George Augustine, and he gave us uh, a bit of his chloride sensor, uh, chlamydion. And at that time, there was no virus, was no <coughs> genetic uh, animal. Now we have uh, uh, chloride sensor expressing animals, uh, kindly given to, to us uh, by Piotr. But at that time, we, we thought, OK, we, we should try electroporation, and we electroporated uh, chlamydion, and uh, this is the result of this uh, method. Uh, so we electroporated this in the, in, the, in, in the brain of embryo, and that's this is the core. Oops. Oh, here is the movie. Sorry, there was um, there's a movie here. So these are cortical pyramidal neurons. They are fluorescent here, and you can see emerging dendrites, uh, cell bodies, and these are pyramidal neurons in the cortex. Uh, which uh, uh, express uh, fluorescent chloride sensors. So when we stimulate the, these animals, we can see how the chloride dynamics changes in the cells, and chloride changes uh, with activation of chloride permeable GABA receptors, for example. Okay, and this is a relatively recent development when we started to uh, use uh, viral tr transduction, and this is technique showing how we, we deal with this technique. So this is the image uh, showing the preparatory stage. So when you take an animal, anesthetize it, and stereotactically uh, make a hole in the brain uh, in a particular region where you want to inject your virus. So then you remove dura, you then you remove this uh, the, the the bone, and then. Uh, you can inject the virus by different techniques. So first, of course, uh, you have to get this virus. You, uh, either you generate it or you can buy it. So as we heard already, it's not easy to bring it to Russia if you buy it. So it's sometimes people choose to generate viruses, but sometimes they smuggle it. But then, anyway, <coughs> what you can do, uh, you can use different techniques, like you can use Hamilton syringe, or in this uh, particular case, you, you, sh you, you shown the glass micropipette, which is filled with the virus. You can, under pressure, you can inject the dye in, in a certain brain region where, you, where you're aiming to. So the animal is kept under anesthesia. So basically, this is the technique, how it works. So you in, in, uh, uh, bring in the pipette, so then you move the pipette a little bit upwards. Uh, and then you inject the virus in this hole which you which you have uh, created by this uh, pipe in the first place. Then you sew the skull and uh, let the animal to recover for for some time, and then 
animals wake up and they recover in, in, in this special condition, in special cages in a warm, warm place. And then uh, you can work with these animals after a certain period of time. Uh, all different constructs and different viruses have different times when you, which you have to wait before the expression will take place. And the duration of this expression also depends on these uh, factors, on these parameters. And in this particular case, I would like to show you just <coughs> a few astrocytes which express in uh, uh, catch uh, construct. Catch is a uh, channel rhodopsin 2 modified uh, for higher calcium permeability. So it's ba basically calcium permeable channel rhodopsin 2, which we're particularly interested in in case of astrocytes because astrocytes uh, activity is related to calcium. And so this catch is expressed on, on, on the promoter GFAP. It's a gliofibrillary acetic uh, protein. This is astrocyte specific protein, and this is, was then associated virus. And to see expression of catch, uh, we used enhanced YFP. So this is yellow fluorescent protein, and that's basically what you see here on these pictures. So this is the channel. Uh, which in which there is no fluorescence of YFP. This is the channel uh, where we, there is fluorescence of YFP, and we can see. So this is just to rule out after, out of fluorescence of the cells. You can see uh, basically uh, cells. Uh, uh, these are astrocytes, pretty well uh, stained with YFP, suggesting that these astrocytes express in catch. And so what we're doing now, we're we're trying to stimulate astrocytes with the light and see what would be the uh, consequences for synaptic plasticity, for learning memory, etc. So, But this uh, turned to be not the, the easiest uh, experiment. And uh, unfortunately, I cannot uh, show you much of the data on this particular project. But uh, I would like to say that it's ongoing. And if someone, especially from uh, people of young generation, would be interested to participate and we, uh, we, we're going to have vacancies in, in my lab in, in, in Moscow, in Institute of Bioorganic Chemistry, for this type of uh, projects and experiments. OK, <clears throat> so this is was part about delivery of, of the uh, fluorescent material or uh, genetic material. And I would like to go to calcium imaging and show several examples how we do this imaging in, in sort of uh, different cell types. Of course, uh, when you choose the method of calcium imaging, you have to consider what you're dealing with. Uh, we, we can look at the calcium dynamics in the presynaptic terminals as axonal varicosities. We can look at the calcium dynamics in, in dendritic spines. This is postsynaptic parts. We can look at calcium in, in dendrites, in the mitochondria, or in the entire cells. And depending on the calcium uh, concentration changes, we have to choose specific dyes. We have to choose the dye with appropriate uh, affinity, uh, with appropriate KD, and we also have to uh, consider duration of calcium signals uh, when we choose the calcium dye, and also we choose the method of imaging. For example, uh, uh, confocal or two-photon imaging, it's a very good approach, but it's not as fast as, for example, digital imaging with uh, uh, digital cameras, CCD or CMOS, uh, which give much less resolution, but, but much faster. Uh, in our experiments, uh, as I already mentioned, we use both uh, chemical dyes and we use uh, genetically encoded dyes. Chemical dyes, it's uh, like routine uh, technique. Chemical dyes are well described and they, they're used for many, many years, for several decades. Uh, calcium dyes mostly based on the BAPTA molecule. BAPTA is a calcium chelator. So to make the dye, you just need to add fluorophore to make it fluorescent. Fluorescent. It could be different fluorophores. Could be benzofluorans, indoles. Uh, could be a fluorescein. It's uh, this molecule here. And uh, when you attach it to BAPTA, you basically get a uh, calcium sen sensing molecule. And then you can modify this uh, molecule, adding uh, different groups. And this would change the uh, affinity for calcium. So and you can see several examples of such molecules here. And this is a real experiment. So I'm running out of time, I guess. So it's a real experiment. We loaded neuron uh, 
with uh, calcium sensor, we loaded neuron with morphological trace, then we trace the dendrite, and then we can see uh, uh, dendrite like this. So this is the neuronal dendrite with the spines on it, but we don't see much of in calcium channels because uh, resting concentration of calcium relatively small. Uh, when we talk about genetically encoded calcium dyes, you can see them here. They have uh, more or less the same idea, the same uh, principle, uh, how they build. Instead of BAPTA, we used uh, proteins which bind calcium. So here you can see calmodulin, and uh, you, we also have fluorescent part. This, uh, for example, calcium sensor based on the FRED principle, fluorescence resonance energy transfer, or uh, in Germany people say first resonance energy transfer. Uh, to acknowledge the, the person who suggested this uh, idea. So these are two fluorescent proteins, which when the calcium binds to calmodulin, this conformation changes and uh, molecules start to interact, and then you can uh, measure threat, which will uh, be proportional to concentration of calcium. You can also connect uh, 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 calmodulin to permutated fluorescent proteins like uh, YFP, GFP, etc. And in this case, uh, when the calcium binds to calmodulin, uh, so then uh, the, the fluorescence intensity might change. So you don't r really measure threat, but you measure directly uh, uh, changes in fluorescence of the dye in, uh, in relation to concentration of calcium. Okay, <clears throat> so then I have to, since I'm talking too slow, I skip one part related to calcium dynamics and astrocytes. So this is maybe another talk. And I will go to the my uh, final part of this presentation uh, related to stimulation. <coughs> okay, this this is a, a interesting important part, and I would like to show you this is uh, s just quickly several slides. Uh, here you can see the part of the dendrite when we performed electrical stimulation. And on the uh, left side, you see morphological trace, where we can see nicely all the structure of the cell. And this part is not sensitive to changes in calcium. And during electrical stimulation, there is no change in fluorescence. But the right part, this is a calcium dye. It's very dim normally, so you don't see much of uh, uh, fluorescence. But during electrical stimulation, you see this flash. So this is the way how you can locally look what happens to uh, calcium dynamics and what uh, kind of ca how different uh, dendritic spines respond to synaptic input. So you can uh, look at the spine after spines uh, independently. So this I skip and I will uh, focus and say a couple of words about opto optopharmacology. So from Peter we heard yesterday that <coughs> Optopharmacology, it's op uh, uh, changes in conformation of the molecules uh, under influence of light. But also another approach, it's photolysis. So photolysis is it's quite uh, widely used technique, for example, in, in case of uncaging. So you can take uh, active substance like glutamate, GABA, or any other chemical uh, which is acting on, uh, on receptors and channels in the brain. And then you can uh, uh, bind it to, to a moiety or, or a group, uh, which would be an uh, organic molecule, which cage it, so make it inactive. But this bond uh, should, be, uh, for, for, uh, should, should be sensitive to light and sh sh should not be photostable. And then if the light absorbed by such molecule, so then the bond is, is breaks, and then you have release of, of active substance, in this particular case, glutamate. So we have caged glutamate, then we uh, basically uh, uh, flash the light in a particular part of the, our uh, sort of uh, tissue, in vivo or in slice, and then we can release glutamate very locally there. And this is the principle shown here. So we do uh, stimulation with uh, Uncaging, and we look at the calcium dynamics in different parts of the dendrites and spines, etc. Okay, so then on this I will skip the rest, and I go to my acknowledgement. Sorry, didn't show you uh, optogenetic experiment, but was fairly simple, and I think other 
people here would uh, show more. And uh, yes, I would like to acknowledge people who work in, in uh, my lab in uh, Nizhny Novgorod, uh, Institute of Neuroscience, and uh, my former lab uh, people in Rikian Brain Science Institute, and uh, hope that uh, in the future I will acknowledge people working in the lab in, in Moscow in, in the Institute of Bioorganic Chemistry. And thank you for your attention. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for this, actually just a lecture, like for the school, it was, was very, very good uh, to do that. Uh, because you are running out of time, we have just one question, just to do it here. Okay. You can, you can speak Russian if difficult. If difficult. <laughs> no, I'm not talking to, I'm not talking to my file, but students. If students. Uh, not, not Russian. Uh, I'm interested in your opinion about um, a thought which was published in a book which is called Roots of uh, Thought. So um, it's written by Cobb, I, I bet you know him, and he wrote that the brain consists of glia and neurons, but neurons, they form a road, roads between parts of the brain because glia do not have processes, long, long long-running processes, okay? So, Leah has no process. And he says that um, the function of neurons is just to transmit information from one town of glia to another town of glia. So if you look from the cosmos, for instance, you see towns in which there is life, thought, mind, memory, and roots and neurons are needed only to transmit information from one town of glia to another. Do you agree with this or not? I was very impressed with this view of the brain. Uh, yes, I, I've heard about extreme views uh, on both sides. Uh, sides. I, I'm, I, I'm heavily criticizing people trying to uh, develop brain-machine interface from reading EEG, for example. I, I believe this is a very difficult uh, task. But uh, this is another extreme. Oh, uh, sorry. Sorry, I, yeah. Yes, and Mark. Okay, uh, so, yes, I've heard about this concept that uh, neurons are wires in the brain and all the thoughts are generated by glia. I, I, I think this is extreme view. I started my presentation today. Very extreme, I would say. I, I, I started my presentation today that the brain is a very complex structure consisting of more than one network. And uh, at this moment, we don't have good evidence to say that one network is better than the other one. So we know a little bit more about neuronal network. That's why it's tempting to think that uh, most of the processes happen in a neuronal network and synaptic plasticity. But uh, uh, my belief uh, that we, we, we say so just because we, we don't know much about physiology of glia and the information coding in glial calcium dynamics. So eventually, when we start, uh, we study this uh, phenomena better, uh, we, we might conclude that, oh, these are equal players, or maybe indeed the neurons a little bit more important, or a little, a little bit more important. At the moment, we have a long road. So I would like to say that we don't know uh, enough about the brain physiology. We have many, many things to study. And uh, this is just not the end of uh, cellular neurophysiology. And uh, we, ha we have to use all these modern techniques, calcium imaging and stimulation, to, to answer these questions. And of course, extreme views are very uh, useful, to my point, because they're provocative and make some people to uh, prove them or disprove them and, and sort of uh, attract more and more young people to do this research. So I, I, I sort of... Uh, I suspect this guy was just provocative. He tried to provoke some <laughs> reaction. <laughs> so of course, it's it's not, it's not maybe yeah. accurate. Okay. So so thank you very much. It is um, it is very pity that you are leaving today. It would be good actually to to have discussion in the school. Just as a very end, I just want to say about engaging compounds. Actually, this is a very very good part. There are some positive parts and negative parts, actually, about the reproducible, about the side effects. Because for GABA, for instance, they have some they have modulation of, of, of glutamate. So you have to be very careful with using that one. But these are also very good techniques. Thank you very much.
And the next one? 